Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. In Richmond County, in Georgia, the sighting was in the U.S. Army Signal School Fort Gordon Small Arms Impact Area. This was in a ravine where a, where a spring-fed rill forms the headwaters of South Prong Creek. It is the center branch of three which form the creek while preparing to check inside the brush that rings the stream in that area, a large man or ape creature 10 to 10 foot 6 inches tall, estimated weight at 1,100 pounds, approached me with an unhurried pace at a distance of approximately 20 feet. The body, except for the face and palms of the hand, were covered with neat, short, one-inch dark brown to black hair, flecked with gray. The attitude was not especially threatening. It was more like a positive defensive move. The face was rather gorilla-like, with dark skin and dark, deep-set eyes. The head sloped backward and was Neanderthal-shaped. It had no eyebrows, prominent lips but not protruding, and a jutting square chin. No ears or teeth were seen. It had prominent nostrils on a slight nose, not flat like a gorilla, and an aged look to the face. The body was all big bone muscle, no body fat, and had thick arms and legs. It made no vocal sounds, and I did not notice any odor. I backed out of the ring of brush and walked quickly back to my truck. It did not pursue me. A footprint measuring 22 inches in length, the heel width of 6 inches with the ball width 9 inches was found. The toes went on an angle but were evenly straight in line. Numerous piles of sand, approximately three gallon size, were on the flat ground of the open ravine floor outside the brush. There were roughly 20 to 30 piles, which were checked to see if they were anthills. Upon kicking a few of them, there were no ants. A vomit pile was also found, which looked like it may have contained deer skin with hair attached. Acorns, not well chewed. A stool pile of deer skin, acorns, and tree bark was also found. A tree with the bark dripped from it, approximately 8 to 10 feet high, was noticed. It was approximately 2 p.m. The area was a draw or ravine with hills along each side, which were covered with dead dormant grass one foot tall and scattered scrub oak brush on the hillside. The floor of the ravine, which was fairly flat, and open except for a tight ring of brush around the stream. Inside the brush, the area was clear around the stream except for a small tree here and there. Elevation of the stream was 380 feet and surrounding hills 500 feet. On to the next one. In Emanuel County in Georgia, our river place is on the Ahopi River next to the Griffin Ferry Bridge. There was an unseen animal howling loudly while violently shaking a 12 by 45 mobile home almost off its block. My wife and I were awake. She was cleaning in the kitchen and I was in the living room reading. Suddenly, a loud howling sound began. At the same moment, the trailer began shaking very violently. The howling and the shaking lasted 10 seconds, but it was very loud, as that of a bullhorn. My first response was thinking we were having an earthquake. My second was someone outside somehow making a noise while somehow shaking the trailer. I grabbed my pistol and ran outside. There was nothing moving outside anywhere. The old trailer we were staying in had been empty for more than three years. When we arrived at the river trailer, the main entrance or door had been forced open. Vandals and animals had been entering the trailer for months, if not years. We had just returned from a military tour, duty in Germany, 
We were going to live in the old trailer until I could build a house on the property. I lived on that property for more than 15 years and hunted the woods. I trapped and fished the river and I never thought of a Bigfoot until a few months ago when I heard the Ohio howl. It was then I realized what happened that night with the trailer shaking accompanied by the hair raising howling. It was about 9 p.m., clear and cold temperature in the mid-twenties and dark with no moon. It was a rural, isolated river bottom, hardwood swamp with scattered mixed pines. On to the next one. In Tattnall County in Georgia, this occurred in the countryside of Glenville, Georgia. The name of the road was Beard Creek Road. The sighting was near Beard Creek Church. Two friends and I were driving out to the country to check out an old graveyard. Near the old graveyard, there's a new church and an even larger, newer graveyard. It was late at night, probably around 10 or 11 p.m. We were heading down a dirt road to go to the old graveyard. Around the new church, there was a big street light. As we passed the church, we noticed this big shadow standing on two feet under the light. We turned around to check it out, thinking it was a person and wondering why they were there so late at night. As we headed toward this shadow, it took off running, still on two feet toward the new graveyard. We followed it with the car through the graveyard on a dirt road. We drove up next to a large headstone, and just as we thought we lost sight of this thing, it stood up from behind the headstone. We froze as it stared at us. It was very tall, about seven or eight feet, and had long brown hair that covered its entire body. Its eyes looked red. I guess from the glare of the headlight, it only stood there for a few short seconds and then turned and ran off into the woods. Needless to say, after seeing it, we did not try to continue to follow it. We were just teenagers, having a few beers that night, so we never told anyone about this. We thought they would just say we were crazy or drunk. I did, however, hear other stories about other sightings of something like this in the area. Also heard one story that it might have been a lost soldier since this was close to Fort Stewart Army Base. I never really knew what it was we saw that night. I didn't want to go back and find out. We were driving to see the old graveyard and church because there were rumors of ghosts out there. We did drink a beer on the way out there, but we were not drunk. We still had our senses working properly. It was around 10 or 11 p.m. The church was built on an old country road. It was in a wooded area. There were swamps and a lot of farmland out there. It is close to an army base called Fort Stewart. On to the next one. In Dodge County in Georgia, we have 80 acres and a swamp on the backside near Cochrane. My father-in-law hit and killed a creature 30 years ago in his car. He called DR and they took it away. He has never heard anything back from it. The creature was six to seven feet tall, covered in hair, walking on two legs like a man. This is the interesting thing. It didn't have a snout like a bear or fangs. 30 people gathered around to see it. I have seen Bigfoot on our property Heard wood knock so loud it scared me to death. Terrible smells I can't explain and have seen footprints in fields. There were also small monkey-like creatures in the trees. We have 80 acres. 30 people saw the dead creature. It was near Swamp Bridge Creek and Gum Swamp. On to the next one. Two friends and I were backpacking in the summer. We were going to hike the Gallatin Divide that summer in Gallatin County, Montana. This was our third weekend, and it being a Sunday, we were hiking out to our car, which was parked at the Portal Creek Access. It was getting late in the day, 
and it looked like the weather was rolling in. We were coming down the west side of Windy Path, so we decided to double time it so we weren't exposed in the weather. We didn't make it to the tree line before the storm hit us. The wind was howling, and a nasty mix of rain and hail came down on us. When we were well enough below the tree line, we decided to sit out the storm by this rock outcropping. Wind whipping through the hills, especially in a rocky area like this, has a very distinct sound. It seemed like there was something else in that howl, something that didn't quite sound like it was part of the wind. No one commented on it, but... I could tell by how Dan and Kevin were looking around that they heard it too. After about 45 minutes, the wind died a bit and only a slight drizzle was falling. We started hiking back down. The clouds were clearing and it looked like we were going to get a good view of the sun setting over the Spanish peaks. We were coming through this clearing that had been cut maybe 10 years ago. The sun was almost out of sight when we heard some thrashing across the clearing. It could have been almost anything, but since we were in bear country, Kevin took out his 357. Not enough to stop a determined grizzly, but it was better than nothing. We proceeded slowly across the clearing. It was maybe a hundred yards towards the older tree line with a lot of scrub and young pines in between. I was looking up for circling carry-on when I heard this howl. It sounded like what I had heard earlier, but now the wind wasn't behind it. It sent a chill up my spine. Dan, who was behind me, yelled something to the effect of, holy bleep, and pointed off to our right. Something massive and dark and clearly running on two legs ran through the brush about 60 yards away and disappeared into the forest. I don't think any of us moved or spoke for about five minutes until we heard the howl yell again, this time pretty far off in the opposite direction than we were heading. We got out of there in a hurry. We didn't tell too many people about this when we got back to town. We did return back to Portal Creek Access the next week to start our hike again, and I've been back that area several times since hunting or just out of curiosity, and I've never heard or seen anything unusual. It was late in the day, and it looked like some weather was rolling in. The wind was howling, and a nasty mix of rain, hail, and wind was whipping through the hills. After about 45 minutes, the wind died a bit, and only a slight drizzle was falling. The clouds were clearing. It was about 75 feet below Windy Path, a rocky pine forest as far as I know. Somewhat above the 45th parallel, I've read about sightings in Anaconda and Pintler region as well as the Helena area, but as far as I can tell, I'm the only one to report a sighting in this area. On to the next one. In Lewis and Clark County in Montana, we were camped up about 150 feet on a dirt road to Dalton Mountain. We were in a pickup with a camper. A friend and I were camped out looking for gold. We had a claim at the top of Madison Gulch near Lincoln. I saw one. My partner was down by the creek and did not see the Bigfoot. I was caught off guard and very surprised. I kept blinking. I just didn't believe what I saw. It was not a bear. I had felt as if I was being watched most of the day. It was standing upright and dark in color and tall and walked into the trees. It did not seem afraid. If anything, I would say it seemed surprised that I saw it. It was about 100 feet or so away. My partner's name was Charles. He's dead now. Also noticed the day before my partner and I went hiking further up. There was a stinky odor that seemed to stay with us for a while. Then it was gone. When we went further and stopped by a second old one-room log cabin, the odor was back. I thought it might be a bear, but we couldn't see anything as we started back. As we started back, the smell stopped. 
It was a bright sunny day between 3 and 4 p.m. On to the next one. In the Sand Basin area in Granite County in Montana, we were in a hunting camp and something spooked the horses late at night. This is not uncommon here, but something was different. Something came running through camp and made the strangest yell I've ever heard. We thought it was probably a bear or what have you, but the next morning we found some tracks that appeared to be man-shaped but larger. We all wondered if it could be what we thought, but needed the meat we were after worth. We just kind of left it at that and used it to scare visiting relatives. We had finished dinner and had been in bed for about half an hour or so when it happened. The terrain is high mountain meadow with lots of fresh runoff creeks, etc. It is swampy in spots, but good wooded cover close by. That is why we hunt here. It is really secluded. On to the next one. On the southern side of US-90, on the Livingston side of the Bozeman Hill, near Livingston, Bozeman, in Park County, Montana, I was driving east on Highway 90 between Livingston and Bozeman, Montana. It was about 7.30 a.m. Montana has long stretches of road, and we had been driving for quite a while. I happened to glance up at the right of the road and couldn't believe what I saw. A very large reddish-brown animal was walking upright about 125 yards from the side of the road. It was very large. I don't know exactly how big or how much it could have weighed, but I do know the hands of the animal hung to about the top of the fence post it was walking next to. Those posts are about three to four feet of exposed posts. There were two of us who saw the creature walking. After we passed it, I said, what the heck was that? My friend responded by saying, I don't know. I don't know what you saw, but it looked like Chewbacca to me. Instead of pulling over and continuing to watch the creature or flag someone down to see it for themselves, we just kept on driving. I will never forgive myself for this, and if I ever have another encounter, I will definitely act differently. I now live in Portland, Oregon, the heart of Sasquatch country. This sighting has provoked an interest in me to find out what is out there. I know something is there. I have begun my own expeditions into the local wilderness, as I know an encounter is basically chance, and this area has been flooded with Sasquatch sightings. The Skookum cast is especially interesting, and I hope it brings some credibility to the search. We were driving home to Livingston, listening to music, and looking at the amazing scenery. It was early morning, but being the big sky country, it was fully illuminated. It was just past the Bozeman Path at the bottom of a mountain ridge, which subsides and then grows into the Bridger Mountain. Very mountainous area, about 50 miles north of Yellowstone National Park. On to the next one. This happened in Del Norte County, California. Me and some friends were shooting bottle rockets off over the gravel area and river around midnight on the 4th of July. A car stereo was on with the bass turned up. It was about 30 to 45 minutes after starting to shoot the bottle rockets that we heard the first whoops. We were walking on a log when we heard whoop, whoop, whoop. Each whoop was rising in tone and also rising in tone from the last one. The hair stood up on my neck. There was about 10 to 20 of these whooping sounds. It sounded like they were a mile away, but seemed to be getting closer or louder as they progressed. The forest was extremely quiet except for the whoops. Everyone was scared and wanted to leave the area immediately, which is what we did. The forest was extremely quiet. It felt odd and was at the end of the Walker Road in the Redwood Forest in Northern California. On to the next one. I was working in the field, conducting a survey to the National Forest users about federal land issues. It was an internship, 
and my field partner and I spent almost every night outside. The night of the incident was late summer, the second week of August. We had conducted the survey at a fishing and camping campground on the Kalmath River and decided to go find our own camp for the night. We chose an undeveloped site just downhill from Highway 96 that had nice sandbars along the Kalamath River adjacent to a parking and picnic area. The parking area was situated between the river and the highway and was downhill from the highway. The road and the river run parallel to each other here. Ben, my field partner, parked the car and we grabbed our sleeping bags and a few items and went to crash for the night on the sandbars. Late that night, probably around midnight, we woke to a large creature walking, actually limping like a step drag a foot, step drag a foot along the hillside below the road and above the river and us. It sounded like Igor, but was definitely a two-legged creature. We thought it was a person limping along the slope that was covered in about 12 inches of oak leaf dust and the drag of the second possibly injured foot was loud through these leaves. Ben asked me if I could hear it or if I was awake. I said yes. I jumped out of my sleeping bag and grabbed a light and a knife. I shined the light up the hill but could see nothing and the movement on the hill stopped when I shined the light. I sat in my bag, firmly grasping the knife with the light off. It continued to walk along the hillside, coming closer to us. Suddenly, it reached a point on the hill directly above us and let out a gnarling guttural yelp. Not a scream, but a cry for help. Over and over again, this gnarled, inward drone was very loud and continuous. Honestly, Ben and I could see nothing and just sat there frozen, waiting. We must have sat there waiting for over an hour, and the creature did the same. It was about 30 feet up the hill from us. Again, in honesty, Ben and I were not scared, and somehow we both fell asleep. I think I relaxed finally and just waited and somehow fell asleep. I awoke some 20 minutes later to a huge splash in the river directly below the sandbar we were sleeping on. Across the river the next day, we could see nothing. No tracks in the sand, no tracks in the leaves, no nothing. We both agreed that it was not a bear, not a cougar, not even a human. There was only one explanation, and it was Sasquatch. The call for help or yelp seemed trustworthy, and it was not a human. It was an inward drone that was very loud and sort of a yelping cry. The cry occurred for about three minutes. That part was kind of scary, but not in a way. We didn't know what to do. We were in shock. On to the next one. Five years ago, I interviewed a group of young people regarding a sighting. The sighting took place in the Mojave Riverbed in Hesperia, California. The first report came from five teenage boys who were exploring down in the riverbed late in the afternoon when a noise in the dense underbrush that grows in places along the river startled them. They said that the noise sounded like something big moving through it. When they moved closer to get a look, they said they saw a large, hairy ape-like creature. As this frightened them, the boys ran home and told their parents, which is when I first heard the story. The boy's father went down into the area of the sighting with a gun to see if he could see what the boys had reported, but found nothing. The boy's older sister rode her horse down to the spot on two consecutive days to try and get a look at the creature. On the second day, her efforts were rewarded. In her statement to me, she said, I was riding north in the riverbed on my way home after searching for several hours when I came to an area where there are two stands of cottonwood and pepper trees, one on each side of the trail. My horse spooked and didn't want to go on. I looked around, and to my right, I saw a tall, hairy thing standing there looking at me. It looked at me for about a minute. Then I turned my horse and ran her in the opposite direction and took another trail home. I investigated the area, and though I wasn't able to see the Bigfoot itself, I did find what seemed to be a nest of sorts where the animal had been bedding down. I also found footprints that measured 20 inches by 11 inches. These prints were in very soft, deep river sand, so I'm sure the size is out of proportion, but maybe this will help in determining the animal's size. 
When I asked the young woman about the color, she said it was a dark brown or black. On to the next one. At that time in my life, I was the co-leader of a boys club in my community. There were quite a few young men whose father had flown the coop or whose mothers had them out of wedlock in our surrounding area. And we were providing a venue for young men to get together with some big brother or fatherly figures in their lives. The boys were very much appreciative of what we were doing. And on many occasions, we planned some type of outing for the day, which on this particular day happened to be running around the swamp in some John boats. There was hardly a house in the area at the time that didn't have, at the very least, one of these little tin boats. And we had brought four of them with the boys via pickup trucks and vans down by the swamp to launch. We had one 12-footer and three 14-foot boats at our disposal, all of which were fairly lightweight, being made of aluminum, and they were easily slid in and out of the pickup truck's bed. Upon arriving at the launch site, I and two other young men, with the assistance of the boys, slid the boat into the water in preparation for the day's activities. Now, just to set the stage for you, this place was on the extreme edge of what you would call rural. Most of the houses in the area would be called shacks by the majority of Americans, with very few inhabitants living in the surrounding area. Simply put, it meant that if you got in trouble around these parts, you were indeed in trouble, with no help available. We weren't going far, and the boats were equipped with electric motors and car batteries, with oars as a backup if we needed them. Our plan was to do an exploratory stint for a few hours to check out some of the critters in the swamp. And believe me, there are more than a few critters in there, some of them could do you in if you're not careful. For the first 45 minutes or so, the young men were a little rambunctious, but then things started to calm down a bit. We were slowly meandering around, pointing out a variety of birds and things, with the men and boys in the boat discussing what we were seeing, when we decided to take a slight detour into the trees and more flooded areas of the swamp. We were negotiating the trees and passages through the flooded woods, when one of the boys said, Mr. LaRue, what is that over there? There are many things in here which swim in the water, including alligators. But this was no alligator as far as I was concerned. We were all well focused on it. And to me, it appeared to be a head and shoulders moving through the water. But of what? I had no idea. I had seen everything that the swamp had to offer as far as aquatic creatures went. I had never seen anything the like of what we were looking at. I was thinking for a moment that it was the head and shoulders of a very large deer, perhaps. But that was just a passing thought. I say this because it really didn't remind me of anything, but my mind couldn't accept what I was seeing. It seemed to be the upper body of something enormous that was actually walking in the water up to its shoulder. We could see no hands or arms. If they were there, they were submerged, as whatever this was seemed to be walking up to its neck in the water. The more I focused on it, the more I was convinced it was an enormous pair of shoulder muscles tapered up to about ear level on a head that we were seeing. No sooner had that thought registered than did the notion of this thing being the Honey Island Swamp Monster come into my mind. Everything that I've just told you took place in maybe 30 or 40 seconds when suddenly this thing was coming out of the water as it was entering a shallower area, heading into the cypress. Within about 10 seconds, it had taken possibly three strides and was fully exposed, walking away into the trees. Everyone was dead silent as we watched this massive monster walk away. Turning its head slightly, it looked our way without missing a step, and then, quite literally, it disappeared into the trees and hanging moth. I saw it come in and out of view, maybe four or five times as it did so, and it was gone. Our jaws were agape as we looked at each other and then back in the direction it had walked out of view. And then we began to talk. All who had heard of the monster were in full agreement that this was what we had just seen. And as for those in the group who hadn't, well, they were now believers as the rest of us were. At the moment when we had first seen it, the group was exceptionally quiet, and with electric motors humming along, 
we were actually moving at a pretty good clip through the calm waters. We had obviously caught this thing unaware as it was navigating a deep thorough to get where it was going. I don't believe it would have trapped itself in deep water had it seen us beforehand. When it emerged from the water, it was covered in soaking wet long hair that clung to the form of its huge muscle-bound body. The monster was all of seven feet tall and was able to cover ground very quickly and quietly as it slipped into the trees and out of sight. On to the next one. In recent decades, Oklahoma has emerged as a hotbed of alleged Bigfoot activity. The lion's share of accounts emanate from the heavily forested eastern section, particularly the Wichita Mountains. However, there is a widely discussed controversy surrounding a video that was supposedly filmed in the Plains region about 35 miles west of Oklahoma City in 2002. According to the story, an outdoor security camera at the small Native American-run Lucky Star Casino captured a dark, nine-foot-tall figure lumbering just under a streetlight, then messing with a grease trap behind the building one night. Word of the remarkable surveillance video spread, and it was apparently viewed by a handful of people, including a Bigfoot researcher named Roger Roberts. Ultimately, however, the Cheyenne and Arapaho elders apparently thought better of the consequences of having gun-toting vigilantes roaming their property. It is said they suppressed the footage either by destroying it or locking it away for safekeeping. The incident was subsequently investigated by other investigators, including a biologist turned Bigfoot tracker named Alton Higgins, who managed to uncover corroborating proof, including footprints at the location on the night in question, as well as other sightings in the vicinity. And, in fact, about seven miles south of the casino lies the town of El Reno, where, in 1970, a creature labeled the Abominable Chicken Man was said to have raided a chicken coop, leaving behind an ape-like handprint. What's odd is that terrain consists primarily of wide open pastures with very few trees, hardly the type of place where you would expect to find a Sasquatch. On to the next one. Chattahoochee National Forest, Georgia. My girlfriend and I were parked and had some pretty heavy conversations. To break free from the tension, I suggested we get out of the car and walk. We headed down the road, hand in hand, enjoying the crisp night air. There was a moon out. We walked by flashlight. Pretty soon, I smelled a skunk. It got stronger, but the smell changed to a rotten smell. Maybe garbage that is hot and moldy mixed with skunk spray. I thought a camper had left rubbish out. I suggested we turn back to the truck because we had gone around two bends in the road and couldn't see back. You know that funny feeling you get when comfort and safety suddenly seem important. So we did about face and headed toward the truck. That is when we saw this figure. It was right there in the middle of the road at a distance of the furthest beam of the flashlight. I used to play basketball and I know this thing was at least eight, maybe nine feet tall and weighed at least 500 pounds, just massive across the chest and biceps. The thing swayed back and forth. You know how an owl moves its head side to side when it's looking at something? In the flashlight beam, it had reflective eyes like dogs have. It never moved toward us. It stayed in place, swaying. It took a minute to register. I stared back, not believing my eyes, and my girlfriend freaked. She started yelling, which really unnerved me, especially in the dark like that. It turned and stepped right off the road, down over the embankment, and out of flashlight range. One step, maybe two, and it was gone, just like that. Mind you now, to get to the truck, we had to walk past the place in the road where this monster stood. How spooky is that? 
I was ready to cut and run the rest of the way to the truck, but my girl was terrified and couldn't make her leg move. She was shaking and hanging on to me, which didn't help. I scanned all the area around us up ahead with the flashlight and told her to run, run fast. But I was literally dragging her with one hand and showing the light with the other. The way back seemed to take a long time, but it was seconds because we hauled. I got to the truck and couldn't make my keys work. I fumbled around for another few minutes. Do you know how hard it is to unlock a car door with one hand on a flashlight, a woman hanging around your neck, and keys in the other hand? We didn't see the creature again. I'm telling you, these things are giant. There is nothing in my life that prepared me for such a sight. It is still surreal to think about. I know what we saw. On to the next one. Hawkins County, Tennessee. Back in October of 1986, Sunny and a female companion were parked on a secluded road, which was nestled in a river valley between two ridges. The location lies near the western edge of the Great Smoky Mountain. Suddenly and without warning, a blood-curdling shriek shattered the still night air, Looking into his rearview mirror, Sonny could clearly discern the form of some massive, hulking creature at least four feet wide. In the moonlight, he could make out the beast's chest down to its waist. Sonny admitted that at the time, he was literally paralyzed in fear for several seconds. Throughout the years, he has come to accept that he must have encountered Bigfoot that night, particularly since happening upon an audio recording of a scream that sounded similar to the one he heard that unforgettable evening. The recording in question was made by law enforcement officer in Washington State who claimed he encountered a Sasquatch in 1975. On to the next one. Blue Ridge Mountains, South Carolina. While driving down a rural two-lane road early one morning in 1995, Lynn C. Johnson, along with her daughter, observed a seven-foot light brown hair-covered bipedal animal crossing the road just up ahead of them. When interviewed, Lynn stated that the creature had exited the woods on her left-hand side and sauntered across the roadway in a human-like fashion to the opposite side. Disappearing into the tree line, Lynn emphasized that although she had been teased for telling her story throughout the years, she has absolutely no doubt about what she saw that day, and that it was what everyone refers to as Bigfoot. On to the next one. I encountered a Bigfoot in northern Massachusetts at the age of 15. My name is Lori, and it's still something that is a challenge for me to talk about. It wasn't until another family member recommended I write it down that I was able to develop the courage to write down my experiences. I was raised by a single mother, and I'm not afraid to admit that she was a bit of a cat lady. Altogether, I would say that we had an average of between 10 to 15 cats at any given time. All of them were outdoor cats that came and went as they pleased. I was quite close to a few of them, and there were also a few that I hardly ever saw. If you've ever owned a lot of cats at once, chances are you know what I'm talking about. One of my favorite cats was this black and white one I named Nala when I was younger, and yes, it was in honor of my favorite childhood movie, The Lion King. Nala was extremely affectionate, often brushing up against my leg and sleeping in my bed. She didn't sleep in my bed every single night, but it was rare for her to go more than two or three nights without doing so. After Nala had been gone something like four nights without coming to sleep in my bed, I asked my mom if she had seen her anywhere. Mother also thought it was weird. Nala wasn't old at the time, so it made it seem all the more strange. We had a garden in our backyard, that wasn't very uncommon for the cat to hang out in. So, I had been looking in there every hour or so once I realized she was missing. 
but no luck. It was probably about a week later that mother called the police because she said she saw a homeless man through the window late in the evening. When I asked her what he looked like, she explained that he was very tall and had long black hair and a long black beard. She said that since it was dark, she had trouble seeing much more than that. The first thing that came to my mind was that a hobo was living near our house and capturing local cats or whatever meat he could get his hands on for nourishment. When the police arrived, neither of them seemed very concerned, and I think they suspected that mother was a little loopy. Even though I didn't see the perpetrator myself, I pleaded with the two officers to take my mother's words more seriously. But when I explained to them that one of my cats had gone missing and that the hobo might be to blame, the officers seemed to take things less seriously than before. They didn't even search the yard with flashlights. They merely said they would keep an eye out and let us know if they found anyone. It was discouraging. Mother might have been an alcoholic, but she was never one to make stuff up or have delusions. I couldn't sleep for the next few nights. I laid in a chair near the window so that I could potentially see the hobo camping near our yard and call the police back over to arrest him when he fell asleep and least expected it. I never saw anything. So I started sleeping in my bed again and just started trying to move on with my life. I would have good days and bad days. The fact was that I really, truly loved that cat. Nala was my favorite. One of our other cats just had a litter of kittens, probably around a month later. They had grown old enough to walk, so I had them out on the back porch getting some sun while playing inside a cardboard box. Of course, I would never leave them there by themselves, so I was right beside them, keeping a close watch, making sure that none of them exited the box and went out into the yard. I had gotten up for a second to grab a bottle of water from where I left it on the railing, when suddenly, out of my peripheral vision, a large, hairy arm poked its way between the wooden fence that circled the balcony and grabbed one of the kittens. Beyond startled, I turned my head to look at the culprit right as it bit the head off the kitten and chewed it for a moment before swallowing. At first, I assumed it was the hobo, but it only took a few seconds to realize this was not a man. I was looking at an animal that I couldn't identify. Its mouth opened so wide while it looked at me and let out this muffled bellow. It was clear that it was attempting to intimidate me from getting any closer to it, but without drawing attention from anyone else. The kittens were whimpering like crazy. They knew that danger was nearby. Luckily, the sides of the box were too tall for any of them to escape. I was about to scream for help, but I quickly remembered that Mother was out of the house. I quickly looked around for something that I could use to defend myself if it were to attack me. The only thing within reaching distance was a hose that we used to water the nearby flowers. The water was still turned on from watering the plant, luckily, so I grabbed it and aimed it at the Bigfoot. It jumped backward before it got hit with the cold water. He then growled at me and then used the hand that wasn't holding the kitten's headless body to throw grass and dirt in the air. It seemed like it was extremely agitated that I would blast that hose in its direction. After it took a few moments to throw its tantrum, I watched as it then ran around the other side of the house and out of sight. Once I caught my breath, I ran over to grab the box of kittens and ran inside quickly, locking the door behind me. I just stood there in the kitchen for a while, trying to calm the kittens and myself down. My heart rate was through the roof. I was so worried that Mother would encounter the Bigfoot on her way back to the house that I called her to warn her. Luckily, she made it home without any complication, and I sat her down to tell her about what I saw. I explained to her that it was no homeless man, that it was a rare creature known as Bigfoot. At first, she laughed at me, but then she started to ponder what she had seen a few nights earlier. She then mentioned that the homeless man was moving around the yard in the strangest of ways. She said that she saw him crawling at one point, she said that it would make some sense given the size of the individual that she saw through the window. She still couldn't seem to believe it a hundred percent, and how could I expect her to? 
What I had just experienced was a conundrum right out of a scary movie. It gave me a lot of respect for what so many people must go through on a daily basis, and nobody believes them. Regardless, my mother helped me gather all of our cats over the next few days, and we kept them in the basement until we could decide how to handle this complication. Fortunately, we had a spacious basement. We weren't able to find all of the cats, sadly, but it did help me feel more at ease to know where most of them were. Mother called the police again, had them come out to our property, and had me try to convince them that I saw an aggressive ape devour one of our kittens. Even though it wasn't the same officers that came out the last time, they still didn't seem to believe either of us that there might be something inhuman near our property. They gave us the same spiel as last time, stating that they would keep an eye out. I respect the police, as I do believe they have a very difficult job, but all of the officers we had dealt with during this frightening time were so disingenuous. I guess you could say we had been dealt a few bad cards. Shortly after the whole incident, we ended up moving in with my grandma, who lived only a few hours away, in a town that's had a lot more going on. We immediately felt safer, and I don't think I will ever live in a wooded location ever again. On to the next one. Bigfoot witness Josh Morris received an interesting Bigfoot account from his wife's uncle, who claimed to have come face to face with Bigfoot inside his home in Spencer County, Kentucky. Such sightings of indoor humanoids are extremely rare, but as we have already seen, not entirely unheard of. They are extremely telling as to the true nature of these creatures claimed by so many experts to be altogether elusive, shy, and retiring, avoiding contact with humans at all costs. I had an interesting story told to me by my future brother-in-law's uncle the other night, Josh said. He was a kid back in the early 50s, heard a noise in the next room of his house, went to check it out, and came face to face with a large hairy creature. He said it was around seven to eight feet tall covered in white hair even over the nose which he described as caucasian looking with big red eyes spread far apart almost to the sides of the head its chest was rounded like when a dog sits up on its hind legs and there was a lot of hair on the feet five fingers and five toes with dark red nails he said he stared at it right in the eyes for several minutes then something about its eyes changed and his blood ran cold, and he ran away to his mother in the other side of the house. When they got back, it was gone, and the doors were locked from the inside. Then his brother told of being in school, having to do a report on something weird that happened to them, and a girl in the class wrote about seeing the same creature and seeing it walk through the upstairs wall of her house. One Spencer County resident claims that he has had repeated sightings of a Bigfoot-type creature over the last several years, beginning in 2002. The first time I saw it was in the year 2002. It was squatted down in a tree when I got home at around 10 p.m. At first, I thought it was a human. I yelled at it, what are you doing? And it jumped out of the tree. It was at least 15 feet up in the tree Yet, it jumped out of it and landed with what seemed to be no injury. When it landed, it stood up on two legs and took off through the wood. I knew then it wasn't a human, because it was too tall. It seemed to have a rather stocky upper body, but a skinnier lower body. The second time I saw it was a few days later. I got home at around 1 a.m. or so and went and got out of my car. I saw a bipedal animal standing to the left of me, watching me. It was only about 15 feet from me, standing right next to my mom's truck. Using the truck as a reference, the witness stated that the creature was at least 8 feet tall. He was reluctant to tell of his sightings until his mother told of seeing a very tall humanoid when she parked the truck earlier. His third sighting took place in the same general area. 
It was right next to our house, walking toward me when I pulled up, he said. Again, it was around 1 a.m. He got out of his vehicle and yelled, I see you. And the creature stopped in its tracks and stood, unmoving, as the witness hastily entered the house. The fourth time was the most dramatic and the clearest observation I had to date, he said. My Australian shepherd was barking crazily at the back door, so I walked outside with him. He took a left off the porch and headed to the tree line along our side yard. Barking, the dog stepped a few feet into the woods where he was no longer in view. Then the barking stopped and the dog backed out of the wood, wagging his tail and looking up. The brush began to move and out came a really long, slender, muscular left leg. The floodlights were on, so I got a really good look at it. It was hairless and seemed to be a light beige color with a slightly gray hue to it. The most abnormal thing about it in regards to human terms was that it had a groin at about the heft of my chest or higher. It made me immediately think of the image that most people describe aliens as looking like. My dog looked at me and the creature stopped moving. It slowly moved its left leg up and moved it back toward its body and then took off through the wood. The fifth sighting, which happened in 2005, occurred in broad daylight as the thing was running swiftly down the hill. It looked like the upper body was hair covered and the legs were not, he said. It was at least eight feet tall. The dogs, usually fearless, did not give chase. The witness admitted it was possible that the thing's legs could have been covered with hairs as well, just of a much lighter color than the brown-colored, stocky upper portion of its body. Strange noises, which sounded like a child's howling, have been heard in the area as well. On to the next one. Does Bigfoot walk abroad in Taylor County, Kentucky as well? My guess would be a resounding yes. A creature or monster has been known to haunt the woods near Campbellsville for at least the last 100 years. Around 1895, there used to be a lot of talk about a creature coming out of the woods in South Campbellsville. Many people swore they had seen it. My dad used to go to school at Smith Ridge, called Carthage, as a boy. Him and some buddies came riding by this area one evening, coming home from school. Every horse just stopped with no command. They couldn't get the horses to move forward for half an hour. They couldn't explain it. A couple of them said they had seen the monster. I think it's safe here to assume that the creature that came out of the wood was likely a Bigfoot. More recently, further alleged Sasquatch activity, this time in the form of blood-curdling vocalization, has taken place in Taylor County. As this next testimony, the following account of a nighttime yowler comes from Campbellsville, Kentucky, just off Burlington Road, near the Pittman Valley area. In 1977, my husband and I bought a small hobby farm in Taylor County, Kentucky, just outside the town of Campbellville. Our farm was surrounded by neighboring farms, but no one lived on the land bordering ours. The owners all lived in town. So, our little farm was fairly isolated, and I liked it that way. In the summer of 1978, I believe the month was July, my husband, while alone at home, heard a sound one evening that frightened the daylights out of him. And he doesn't frighten easily. He called me at a friend's place, screaming at me, where are the shotgun shells? His nervousness scared me. I didn't know what was going on, and he wouldn't tell me. He just kept screaming, where are the shotgun shells? I finally told him, and he slammed the phone down. It wasn't until later that my husband related the story of what he had heard. He never did see anything, and the years went by with no answers to that cry he had heard that evening. Although, for the first several years, as we watched nature films, which had various wildlife cries, I kept asking him, did it sound like that? To which he always replied, no, it was nothing like I'd ever heard before. In 1988, again, in the summer, and the month was August, 
It had just started to turn dark in the evening when my husband came home from outside and all he said was, do you want to hear the sound? He didn't have to say any more. I knew right away what he was referring to, so we both went right outside and stood outside our kitchen window. I was standing there listening when I told him, I don't hear anything. He quickly replied, shh, just wait. So I continued to listen. All of a sudden, this horrible cry came up from our wood where our two creeks merged. It caused chills to run up and down my spine. My first reaction was shock. Then another cry was heard. This time, I felt myself slowly edging backward toward the house. Whatever this thing was, the cry was like nothing I had ever heard from any wild animal before, and I remember starting to shake with fear. Then another cry was heard. This time, it came from across the road in the wood, where the creek continued to flow. This cry hadn't even crescendoed when there was another cry heard from our side of the woods again. Oh my God, there were two of them, I thought. That was it for me. I turned and ran into the house. My husband came in with me, but he grabbed the shotgun and went back outside. He wanted me to hold the light for him as he investigated the woods, and I stated, you're out of your mind. I'm not going back out there. That basically was all that happened that night. My husband never saw anything, nor did I, but I did smell something. It was a very strong, musty odor that wasn't pleasant. Actually, the odor was like wafting across with a gentle breeze. So sometimes it was very light and sometimes much stronger. I remember wrinkling up my nose when it was strong and thinking, what on earth is that smell? So now, after 10 years, I had heard the same sound that my husband had heard alone back in 1978. The next day, I did go down to where the two creeks meet and walk along the banks looking for strange prints, but didn't see any. Even though it was broad daylight and a gorgeous sunny day, just being down there gave me the creep. What had happened the night before had really shook me up, and never again did I enjoy being down there anymore. Just the replay in my mind of those cries was enough to make me jumpy whenever I was close to the woods or the creek area again. The sound of those cries stuck in my mind, and I had a gnawing feeling that I had heard that sound before, but where? I was a video collector back then, and quickly went through all of my video collection to see if anything would jog my memory. I have many natural wildlife tapes, so I thought maybe that is where I had heard it, but when I came across a movie entitled Sasquatch, a feeling inside of me told me to watch this tape, so I did. I sat in my living room and watched all the way through that movie until close to the end. They had the sound, the very same sound that my husband and I had just heard a few nights ago. As soon as I heard it, chills ran up and down my spine. I quickly rewound the tape to the beginning of where that sound was and left it there until my husband came home from work that evening. As soon as he came home, I told him I had something I wanted him to watch. So, within a few minutes, he was seated in the living room, and I played the tape. As soon as that cry was heard on the tape, he jumped up yelling, That's it! That's the sound! We replayed that part of the tape over and over again, trying to allow all this information to sink in. We now felt we knew what we had heard. It was a Sasquatch, or actually two of them in the middle of Kentucky. An experience like this, you don't ever forget. You can't. It'll stay with us for the rest of our lives. There were several other odd details that she later recalled thinking about the event. The first was that while I was listening for the strange sound, I later realized that none of the normal summer sounds were heard. No cricket, no catty did, no bullfrog. None of the sounds that we always heard on a summer evening were around. It was dead silent until this thing let loose with its god-awful cry. Another was this odor that kept drifting up. It was really offensive. It's hard to describe, 
but it was like a musty smell that also smelled like death too. Anyone who has lived in the country and has had a rat die within the walls or floors knows what I mean. Add a strong musty odor to this and it's close to what I smelled that night. The third thing that I noticed, and maybe this is the oddest of them all, is that my horse was standing near the barn when all of this happened, and he acted like nothing was wrong. Even when these things were howling, or whatever you want to call that sound, my horse just acted like he heard nothing. He continued to munch on grass as if he neither heard nor sensed anything was wrong. This has always baffled me. Could it be that the horse could not hear the same sound as the witness and were therefore unaffected by them? The witness also noted that there have been many Black Panther sightings in this area, but feels sure what she and her husband heard that night was definitely not a cat. I hope you enjoyed those encounters, and if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!